right, hey everybody, my name is Danny. Welcome to our winter creative mornings. And we started this in August, and we wanted to basically try to bring people together in a new way. And it's been uh, an amazing experience. I've met so many people. Um, and uh, that's, that's been one of the highlights of the year, honestly, kind of what we've, what we've been able to kind of consistently accomplish. And uh, Creative Mornings is a global organization that gathers um, you know, freelancers, creators, uh, techies, artists, uh, and lots of hangers-on. I'm just kidding. Uh, um, and, uh, and many others who, who want to kind of support that community as well, which is so critical. Uh, we have uh, today, actually, which is really neat, at least a few former speakers who came back. Catherine is here. I think I saw Zach come in. There he is. Zach Weston's here. And that's pretty amazing that you, know, you can kind of have folks who would be participating as our keynote, and then they feel safe enough that they can be, come into that community and, and just sort of be part of it. And so thank, Catherine's actually our first speaker, so I appreciate you leading the way on that front. Um, and uh, we also, um, this is our first time not at Wave Street Studios. And I assured Rhett um, that we are deeply appreciative, Rhett and Judy, of everything they've done uh, to you know, kind of help us get off the ground. But we also want to recognize other creative spaces that are here. Uh, and, and, uh, and Wave Street is an extraordinary one. And this is another extraordinary one. And we will continue to explore new spaces. Uh, and we have somebody from Santa Cruz who I met today, um, from, who works at Adobe. Oh, there, there you are. Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, hi, I'm Megan. Hi, Megan. I live in Santa Cruz. Um, I work at Adobe, and I work with Good Morning Talkers actually around the country. And Amazing. So excited to find a talker who interacts with creative people in the backyard. So hopefully yeah. we can do one a little bit further north. Than yeah. That's really cool. So there's not a Creative Mornings in Santa Cruz, yes. right? I don't think there is one in Silicon Valley right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are no creative people left in Silicon Valley. They're all here. <laughs> They're all here. They're all here. We want them there in Utah? That's good to know, actually. That's good to know. Um, cool, so you know, I think that yeah, that's a really interesting idea that, there, that there's people in Santa Cruz who want to connect to us, right? And so then we kind of have to like counter this with, hey, we have this loyalty to Wave Street, which is, which is real, but then you know, I meet, you know, come across Wendy, and I knew because she has a connection to our kids' school. And, um, and then we have this other space, but then we meet somebody from Santa Cruz today, and we're like, well, maybe we should do this at the power plant, you know, in Moss Landing, yeah. which is, if you, if you do business on, in the Central Coast, that's as far as people from Santa Cruz will come, is, <laughs> is, the, power, is the power plant. They'll come to the power plant, and they will not go further south. So my name is Danny, um, and we started Creative Mornings, Mike Buffo and I, to help do things like this. And um, I'm really excited for you all to be here. Today we have a, a, another, a, a guest host who's the same guest host who's going to be kind of driving a lot of the, the discussion. So I'm going to go into that uh, glass box with Maria Grace and uh, John and uh, Alora and sit there. And uh, so I'm really excited to welcome Michelle. And the crowd Michelle is a pillar of our creative community. Uh, and, um, you know, as she's said a couple times, you know, she was, she's actually from here, and Michelle could have, Michelle could have rejected this new energy that, that we tried to bring instead. I tried to, but you're too charming. <laughs> so annoying. That's, that's, that's the problem. Um, and so instead, she embraced it, and she connected me to many people, and, um, and now we're friends. Thanks for coming, everybody. This is a really exciting um, new space to be in. It's really blowing my mind. It's like the exact opposite of Wave Street in a beautiful way. Both spaces are dynamic, and this one is going to bring new energy. I'm happy to see new faces. And thank you, Chef Anthony, for providing us with some nutrition this morning. Anthony, just we ran into each other at the farmer's market, and he was like, hey, I really want to help. And I was like, OK, amazing. So I love that input and creative uh, part of, like food to me is kind of my number one favorite creative uh, topic <laughs> to be continued on that. Oh, Chef Anthony. Yeah, so also you do classes, yeah? So if people want to learn more about veggie forward, vegan forward, healthy food, we can hang out with uh, Chef Anthony, which sounds like loads of fun. 
Um, I love the tofu scramble. I didn't try yours, but I make it at home, and it really blew my mind. It's a lovely, quick, easy thing to do. High protein, super, super. Oh, and our partners, Michael Buffo, House of Eight Media. Big round of applause for everybody who like wants to come but can't and wants to do a replay. For everybody who speaks. For all of our community people, if you have something you want to announce and share with the community, you can come up here and share it, and that will only perpetuate further via the media that's provided by Mike, and that's just super amazing. Uh, Wendy Kirby Music, thank you, Wendy, for welcoming, um, welcoming us into your space. It's gorgeous. Congratulations. And I'm excited to hear you play. You're going to be our opener. And um, yeah. Ad Astra's not here this time. <laughs> so sad. Um, yeah, Hawk Tower, that is Danny's uh, new innovation that everyone should learn more about. It's very exciting. Um, new branding by Maria, gonna plug. Beautiful. Um, Mercer Advisors, Pearl Works. If you need a co working space, you need to have a meeting with uh, new creatives and you can't do it in your little apartment. Pearl Works is the place to go. I can't wait to have a meeting for Magdalena Magazine. Yeah. Woo! Oh, yeah, and then there's me. Yeah, I have a magazine. It's called Magdalena Magazine. It's a limited edition run. I brought it here to sell, and I brought it as a gift, so everyone can check underneath their seats. There's two copies that are out for generous Look under your seat, take your hand, put it under your seat right now. Yes. If you... I'm looking at you because I know I put one there, so get creative with your bending. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Merry Christmas. I know the chairs are a little awkward and like the spacing. Ooh, you got one. Yay. Magdalena Magazine is 100% recycled paper. Go ahead, take it out. <laughs> Merry Christmas. It has a special binding on it. Oh, no, did it bend? Um, it's beautiful. It's an arts activism magazine. It's my own thing. And I'll be selling them in the back if you want to get a special copy. They are $40. And they're gorgeous works of art. You can also be a sponsor if you're interested in bringing your business on board. Let us know. Talk to Cassie, talk to me or Danny. If you want to be a part of this, um, we would love it. You being here alone is already incredible, so thank you for being here. Oh. Yeah. Pain. Pain. Pain is so hard. Um, and I'm so excited to share this conversation. I know all around the world, Creative Mornings are going to be talking about pain, so we're not alone, and that's always a good thing to remember when you're in pain. So I'm really excited to welcome our guest, our first guest, Wendy, who's going to be talking about her album, which was inspired by pain. So we're going to go right into our creatives. Thank you for being here. <laughs> I am Wendy Kirby. I am so just excited to have all of you here in my space. This is so fun for me to just feel all this energy and have all of this creativity here. So this space for me is a place to gather for people to be creative. And I teach music classes and piano and I have a concert series and I do some retreats. There's all kinds of things going on, but I also wanna invite the community to come in and, and use the space as well. So I have some cards up front if you're interested in, if you can imagine yourself here with a little pop-up of some kind, um, please talk to me because that'll be really uh, fun for me to have you here. So um, <clears throat> as she said, our theme is pain. So, um, Pain comes to us in a lot of different ways and um, takes a lot of different forms. It can be emotional, it can be physical. The form I want to talk to you about today a little bit is grief. Because to me, grief is one of the heaviest forms of emotional pain. And um, I came to my what I feel is my true creativity through grief. 
So there's a lot of studies, there's a lot of journals written on what happens to the brain when we go through a lot of grief. And one of the things that happens is the left side of your brain kind of shuts down. So your logical side kind of quiets a little bit, and your right side of your brain actually can become more awakened. For some people, it doesn't really give them a boost, but they're just more aware of, of their feelings or uh, ways needing to express them. And that's what happened to me. So I went through a very, um, very difficult time period uh, about the end of 2019 and then moving into 20, not COVID related, but of course that really helped <laughs> make things so much more um, big. Um, but um, I went through this process, and this piano has always been my form of expression. I'm a classically trained pianist, but that training is extremely regimented. It's um, rigid. It's based on um, a lot of perfection, and it actually is very left brain in a lot of ways. And... Um, when I started going through all of this, I was so, I'd sit at my piano, but I couldn't practice. I just could not make myself practice Beethoven and Chopin and all of the um, composers that I've always loved. I put my hands on the keys and I just couldn't do it. So I started to just play like simple chords and just listen to myself and improvise a little bit. And by the way, improvising and composing was not really part of my life up to then. I tried some improvising because I really wanted my students to know how to do it, but I really hadn't like gone deep and entered into that part of who I am. So I started to do that, and as I did that, I started to compose this music, and I was just like, where is this coming from? It's that whole thing of, you know, you're that, that channel. Um, and I, as, as I did that, I started to um, feel a lot of gratitude for the people in my life that were there for me, loving me, standing by me through this, this difficult time period. So I started writing music for those people. And as I did this, my heart began to open and I started to heal. And I thought, okay, I'm going to ask. I kept seeing a flower, like a, a blooming flower. And I thought, okay, I'm going to ask all of these people that I'm writing music for, what their favorite flower is, and that's going to be the title of the track. And at the time, I didn't had no idea I was going to record an album. I was just writing this music, and I was going to send them a voice memo and say, thank you, and here. <laughs> Hope you like it. But then it developed into everyone said, well, we want to hear that music again. Can, what, what can you do? So then the album Bloom was born. And if you go and listen to it, you know how deep this bloom is for me. And when you listen to each track, it's not a flower per se. It's, it's really about a soul. It's about a person. So um, the person I want to talk about um, is my really good friend, um, Leela Viss. And Leela Viss is a pianist and just the most beautiful human being. And Thanksgiving Day of 2019, her son was, he's living in Florida, marine bi biology major. They're out diving and snorkeling on Thanksgiving Day, had their flags out, doing everything right. And um, a man had just bought a brand new powerboat and ran right over Carter. And so Carter, this is just a few days after his, his accident, so Carter lost his right arm, and by the way, he's a pianist and a guitar player, so that was just, anyway. And the rest of his body was just completely, um, I, don't, I can't even find the right word because no words express. So he spent the next few months in the hospital rebuilding. They re rebuilt his body, and he actually came out of this alive, which is a, a huge miracle. Um, so when I was writing this uh, piece of music for who I thought, I thought it was for Carter. And um, I realized when I sat at the piano and started playing it again, I was like, no, this, this is actually for Leela. This is for Leela's heart. And this is for my, 
like mother heart. See, this is pain, right? Um, feeling her heart and like realizing that her son's going to have to start a brand new life that's a much, much different life than the one he was living. So the good news is where we're going to go next is that Carter has like started to thrive again. He, he speaks all around. He started a, a foundation for boat safety and education, and he's doing all these amazing things. When he goes out and plays, he plays left-handed pieces. He just married this gorgeous girl, Emily, and he's, he's rebuilt just this beautiful life. But I wanted to put um, a couple of quotes up here. So, take courage and be held was something that Leela would say to me as we would talk. We were both going through stuff, but I always felt like there's no way what I'm going through is anything like what you're going through. And she'd always say, stop comparing. You don't compare pain. You don't compare grief. Just here, I'm offering you space, and I'm offering you courage. So you always said, I have space for you. So that was absolutely amazing. Um, and then this take your broken heart and make it art is actually a Carrie Fisher quote. So when I asked Leela um, what she wanted her flower to be, she said, I, a dandelion. And I said, a dandelion? What, that's a, isn't that a, a weed? You know, are you sure? And she said, yes, absolutely, because think of what a dandelion does, right? It blooms, and then it blows away, and then all these little seeds are planted, and then you have all of these, you have more dandelions, you know? I thought that was just such a, an incredible... Um, way of thinking of it. So I'll just leave this quote up here and I'm going to play um, that piece for you, Dandelion. One more thing. Um, so Leela's creativity came, she started to blog on um, the care page. She's writing a book right now. So her, her creativity through her grief was writing. Carter, after he came through the accident, again, he's a right-handed man um, started drawing with his left hand and he still loves the ocean life and he knows that I love butterflies so he drew this butterfly fish for me after the accident um, so he is still continuing to to create in this way as well
Thank you. Um, I'm going to play just one more for you. And the reason I picked this piece, um, <clears throat> it's called Sage. And it was actually the very first piece of music that I wrote. And it was when my heart started to unravel and uh, fall apart. And this is the first thing that came out of my grief. So I thought it would be a good thing to play in this setting. And I named it Sage. And as I did this, I also looked up the meanings of all the flowers. And what was interesting is when I asked people their favorite flower, it fit their personality like perfectly. Um, I picked this name. Sage kind of represents uh, wisdom and respect and gratitude. And this piece has really become known as gratitude to me. So grateful that this creative um, thing has come out of me and that this is the way that I play the piano now, that I am able to compose and share myself with um, other people. So this is called Sage. What a beautiful heart, Wendy. Thank you so much. I want to give you another round of applause. <clears throat> um, I just love the way that creativity can be so healing and tell stories that um, mark the hardest times in our lives in a beautiful way. So that's, I'm like, where can we buy your album? Can we download it? That sounds fun. That's so sweet. Thank you. I'm going to share that. Um, and now we have our main speaker. Now I am up and down. Up and down. I get to practice my squats this morning. After all, I thought I didn't have time. Um, this is my resting pose. <laughs> um, the powerful pose. Susan Swick? So excited to share you. We have so much to celebrate in our community with um, all that you're bringing, so I'm going to leave it to you. Come on up. Good morning, everyone. I was like, Mark. 
Um, I don't feel like the main event. I feel like we just had the main event, but I'm delighted and honored to have been invited to be part of this conversation. Hey, guys in the room. <laughs> what a great little room you got there. Um, I'm, so uh, I'm, I work at Ohana. We have a few of my amazing team here with us. Um, and Ohana is a center we're building at Montage Health for um, youth and family mental health, both treatment where there's illness, but also um, to be a center for all families to cultivate uh, mental health. We call it mental fitness, because when you say mental health, it kind of sounds like you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. You're like mental health issues, mental health challenges. So we try to think of it as something that's an asset, but that has to be cultivated and built. And at Ohana, we actually start every meeting that we have with a mindful moment. Now, I think this crowd is probably generally in a pretty great centered state, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Anyone here have a meditation practice? Oh, yes, okay, well, you can teach me. Um, my favorite teacher said mindfulness and meditation is easy to learn and very, very hard to master. Um, and so practice is the soul of mastery. Um, for those of you who do not have a mindfulness practice, mindfulness is simply a state of non-judgmental awareness, right? It's not emptiness. It's not no thoughts, no feelings, blank slate. Um, it's a state of sort of quiet sense awareness of what you are thinking, feeling, of your physical sensations, but without struggle, right? Without judging yourself for what you're feeling um, or really struggling with uh, thoughts um, or sensations, which is actually a very natural response in what we're gonna talk about. So my mindfulness practice usually involves focusing on the breath because it's always with us. If it's not, we have other problems. Um, so it's easy to come back to it. And I'm going to lead us on a mata, which is a kind of poem where every word you breathe in or you breathe out. And you just get to come back to that. Now, at some point, even in our very short practice, you're going to notice that you're thinking something or feeling something. Be like, I'm cold. Um, this is weird. Her voice is odd. <laughs> Did I turn off the stove? That means you're doing it right, right? That those thoughts are still happening. Our minds are busy places. A state of mindfulness is to recognize it, to catch it, say, ah, there I go, and come back to the breath. That helps you cultivate that capacity to be just one step above and observing. Without going too deep, I invite everybody to just Think for a moment what comes to mind when you think of a personal experience of pain. Um, what story comes to mind? Is it a story of physical suffering, of an injury, an accident, childbirth? Um, is it a story of mental anguish, of grief, of other kinds of loss, of depression? of relentless anxiety. There are many kinds of pain. Um, and I was, I've never been asked to speak about pain before, um, except indirectly by my own children, <laughs> who insist that I'm forcing it upon them. Um, and in, I was so engaged, and I'm so I'm really delighted to be part of a conversation about it. I was so engaged by the by the topic, um, and I wanted to start with just where I often start, which is the words, because words do matter, particularly with pain, um, where we don't have other ways of measuring it. Um, and these definitions are from the Oxford English Dictionary, right? It's physical suffering or discomfort caused by illness or injury, or it's careful effort, great care, or trouble. I took pains to be ready to share my thoughts with you today. I thought, 
Those two definitions are fascinating. But let's go farther. Let's, let's go beyond Oxford. They can be a little rigid. Um, this first definition, pain is weakness leaving the body. Does anyone know where that comes from? Don't have a lot of Marines in this room. This is the US Marine Corps. Um, I think there's something to that, but it's also a little rigid. Um, life is pain. Anyone who says differently is selling you something. That's from one of our great storytellers, William Goldman. That line's from The Princess Bride. <laughs> Um, and then another storyteller, um, C.S. Lewis, also a theologian of sorts, said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. When I was in medical school, a little over 30 years ago, which pains me to say. <laughs> we really thought pain was our territory. We're like, that's what, we're, that's what we do, right? We're here to treat it, eradicate it. It's what we measure. It's what we're here. We're experts on it. And the International Association for the Study of Pain, a bunch of my expert colleagues, um, define it. They actually had a definition that was much more like the Oxford English Dictionary. It was more about, literally included the phrase tissue damage. They still do. Um, but they expanded this just in 2020, in the midst of COVID, um, to say it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. I was like, wow, they covered a lot of bases here. They began, <laughs> which is good. Um, and this, has anyone seen this little image here? Yeah, this pain scale. This is the Wong Baker pain scale. I got, um, this was a widely distributed pain scale in the 90s and the early aughts when a joint commission, which regulates hospitals, decided that pain needed to be more aggressively assessed and treated. It was funded by a number of pharmaceutical companies that have more recently become famous for these efforts um, so that everybody could easily assess pain, even without language, right? I actually think these faces are bananas. That's the clinical term where I'm like, these faces do not illuminate a rich spectrum of experience for me. Um, and the idea was that everybody should be in a state of zero to two. Anything above two needed treatment. Pain was to be eradicated. And we all know how that went, right? Millions of dead, enormous suffering. But words really matter. <clears throat> um, I think beyond faces, um, we, th we need to think about the words we use to describe pain. It's true in all of medicine, because um, we don't have heart rate or temperature or x-rays or lab work that can tell us something about pain. We need words. In psychiatry, it's what we got. It's how we encounter. It's how we query. It's also how we make sense of our experience and the world. So we pay a lot of attention to language, and thinking about the range of pain. These were just, this was my struggle, this was my pain. I took pains to find a range of language and think about how it ranked um, in degrees of pain. So if you can't see it, I, I start with discomfort. I often will describe, well, and then hurt, ache, anguish, and torment as pain sort of expands, as it swells. But I wanted us to think about the fact, and often I have to think about the fact in my clinical work, that we get into trouble when we equate discomfort or unease with torment. Because pain always um, has something to tell us. When there is a torment or an agony or an anguish, we tend to try to avoid it or eradicate it, right? But discomfort actually 
is an important part of life. Um, in child psychiatry, I say it's not just important, it's essential, right? It is essential to every developmental step for a child to master a challenge and make no mistake, growing up is about a series of challenges and mastering them to then take the next step. But mastering a challenge actually requires being uncomfortable, uneasy, in that liminal space where what you know really well doesn't quite apply. Um, and if we avoid that discomfort, we can get into trouble, right? So we, I sometimes talk about the virtuous cycle um, of development. Starts with a challenge. Let's say the challenge is algebra. <laughs> it wasn't bad for me. It was bad. Um, and that facing something that you don't know how to do and you're expected to master creates uncertainty, anxiety. It's really uncomfortable. Um, and then you try, right? And you either try because you have to or because you have support around you saying try or because it, it hooks you, gets you really curious. Um, but this pretty little cycle that says then you manage it, you master it, and you feel great about yourself, this part of the cycle, going from challenge, anxiety, and then try, actually there's a lot of turns at that wheel before you get to mastery. And every turn at that wheel involves failure. And failure is painful, especially if you're learning to ride a bike, right? You fall off that bike. You're going to bloody your knee. It's, and, and parents often will say, oh, well, but of course, it's natural to know that it's okay to get back on the bike. If, if parents always responded by saying, and I'm not sure why we all think learning to ride a bike is the most critical skill. We should have more bike lanes if we really thought that was true. Um, but it feels like a passage that all parents are pretty comfortable saying, I'm going to teach my child how to ride a bike. I don't need to be a competitive cyclist. I don't need to be a physicist that understands why these, why these vehicles actually stay upright once the wheels are going fast enough. I just know it's going to work. And in fact, I know that in my bones so that I'm going to put my child, my most precious cargo, on this contraption that will not stay up on its own and push them. <laughs> and when they fall and they bleed and they cry, I'll comfort them and put them back on it. <laughs> right? But that is an experience I invite all of us to hold on to when thinking about discomfort. That discomfort is a critical and essential ingredient in growth in mastery. Sometimes we can't avoid it, um, but it is essential. Now, you might be thinking, I'm kind of in love with pain. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not a Marine. I don't think that pain is a sign of virtue or your strength. I don't think it's a marker that it should always be pushed through, right? That sometimes that will get us in trouble too. But pain always has something important to tell us. And you need to listen, right? It sounds simple, it's not so easy, because pain hurts, right? Sometimes what it has to tell us is don't touch the stove, it's hot. Sometimes that's not what it has to tell us, but if we pull our hand away every time something smarts, we're like, don't do that again. You're not going to have a chance to learn what all the different kinds of discomfort have to tell us. I'm not suggesting you keep your hand on the stove. <laughs> you trust your gut. But if you can take a moment, catch your breath, recognize that it's pain, I often will say to my kids, shake hands with it. You don't have to hug it. You don't have to embrace it. You don't want to get too attached. But shake hands with it. Because you have to be able to describe it 
to understand what it's here to tell you. Not easy, because pain hurts, right? This is where mindfulness can come in handy. Being able to just keep yourself as calm as possible so you can bear something difficult, maybe in doses, to be able to describe it. Where does it sit in your body? What does it feel like? How does it change with time? How does it change with connection with another person? Maybe you can figure out what triggered it, what's causing it paying attention to what we spoke about before with that little mindfulness exercise. What are your thoughts? What are the feelings? What are the physical sensations? What are the facts out in the world? Because if we don't slow down and attend to those things, it's very easy to start thinking feelings are facts. Right? Or that your thought about it is a fact. And then we can get tangled up can get stuck. So pain isn't good or bad, it just is, right? Pain happens. Um, If you're grown up, it's essential. If we're grown old, (laughs) it's inevitable. It accumulates. But if we pull our hand away from the stove too quickly, every time we experience it, we're going to miss what it has to tell us. And we're going to miss the opportunity to master a new challenge, maybe to learn we could run a marathon, or to learn when it's time to pause and hydrate, stretch, walk a while, maybe even get that ankle checked so you could run a marathon next year instead. I will never be able to do this, by the way. (laughs) Because if we can catch our breath and pay attention to pain, we can become more fluent um, in the varieties um, of experiences. We can learn the lesson. It can can teach us, right? We don't want to miss an opportunity to make meaning of something difficult, to make music, to make art, to make a friend, Right? to make a discovery, to make a discovery about ourselves. And as we get more fluent, as we get better at taking a breath, paying attention, describing what it is, we actually will get better at recognizing pain in others. Right? So that when someone we care about is suffering, we can not turn away. Right? We turn towards them. We can bring compassion and connection. We can find a way to sit beside them and keep them company and bear it together because that is the most effective treatment for pain that we have. So thank you for the invitation and your attention. Thank you, Dr. Swick. I think uh, she was discovered before she even like blew up, but in my world, by Danny, who, you know, before the article came out, before Ohana opened up, uh, Danny recommended you, and I was like, "Where? Did, how do you find these amazing people?" So yeah, thank well, you. My, your agent, yeah, <laughs> a mutual friend, I think, in this case, um, which was great. So uh, yes, thank you so much, Dr. Swick and Wendy. That was extraordinary. I think we we're all taken completely in back, but just the contrast between, or the melding of art and science in a way, um, and to be in your space and, and to welcome us the way you did, it's really incredible. Um, it's great to see this full room here and, and just the energy. I, was just, I just texted uh, Tina Eisenberg, who's the CEO and founder of Creative Mornings and sent her a picture. I said, CMMRY number five, you know? <laughs> uh, so that was cool. Um, so next month, um, can't really see it behind me, but we have a, there's a woman named uh, Stephanie Whittles Wax, and if you look up Stephanie and her company, Lemonada Media, it's a podcast company. Stephanie lives in Pacific Grove, wow. and um, they just won an award from Apple for best podcast of the year. Uh, the host is um, a woman named Julie Louis Dreyfus, uh, and uh, also on her roster is uh, Sarah Silverman, 
and some amazing, amazing people, um, Samantha B and others. So Stephanie and a, uh, a friend built this company and she lives in Pacific Grove. Uh, I'm cheating in the sense that Stephanie's actually spoken at a Creative Mornings event, um, I think it was five or six years ago in Houston, which is where she's from. And, and then they, you know, sh she moved here uh, with her family and, and, and she's amazing. Uh, so she'll be our speaker next month and talk about uh, her process of building the company and her, her uh, you know, what it means to run a podcast company and things like that and, and just her personal journey, which you can read about online. Uh, she's very prolific as a, uh, as, a, you know, as a writer, as a publisher. She's wrote, written a lot about actually her, her journey of grief as well uh, with her brother. She talks about it very openly. And so that's our speaker next month. Um, and so hopefully we'll be back at, we will be back at Wave Street next month, but we will, as I said, do other uh, destinations. Hi, I've met some of you. I'm Denny Bryan. I'm not here to do a plug for a show or an event or anything else, but I want you to come actually closer here. Come here. Because these two guys have started this in August. And I don't know, I, I came across um, his LinkedIn um, message saying that he wanted to start a Creative Mornings chapter here in Monterey. Um, and I have been familiar with Creative Mornings, but I always wanted to attend some, and they were never anywhere close by. So I was like jumping on the opportunity. It's like, yes, we need Creative Mornings here. I think that's awesome. And I think these two guys deserve an extra round of applause for what they've created here in a short period of time. So thank you. None of this would happen without those guys, so Thank you very much, Danny. That's only partially true in the sense that we actually have an incredible group of volunteers. Um, I think about you know Stephanie and Wendy, who's here, uh, Cassie, uh, Jillian, who's under the weather, um, Michelle, of course, yeah, Michelle, and, and, and there are others as well. So thank you all so much. It's become like lighter and lighter lift for, the, for, for Mike and I, in a sense, because so many people have just sort of stepped up and played really organic roles. Uh, Sean is actually going to make himself available as like a speaker coach to people in the future, which is amazing. So we have a lot of, you know, people really kind of coming out. So thank you so much for coming. Happy holidays, and we'll see you in January. Thanks, everybody.